texture that's going to allow it to allow it to scrape through things, either scrape um, nutrients off the surface of rocks, for instance, or go all the way through that clamshell. All right. Finally, we have our polyplacophora, our chitin. So we can see we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pieces. So it's important that you don't think that this ventral line, excuse me, um, dorsal line running down here, that doesn't separate into separate plates. So we have eight plates. We're gonna see a lot of, a picture in a minute of a bunch of different types of chitin. They all have those eight plates. Here they are. So again, they look fairly different in the grand scheme of things, but they're all gonna have eight. Here we have our snail and our slug, which are part of what class? Our gastropod, yeah. Excuse me. Um, so if we look at a carnivorous snail, or excuse me, uh, this is just snail, we'll get to the carnivorous one in a moment. We can see that one single piece shell, um, which you guys are probably fairly familiar with. Here we have a whelk, which is a carnivorous snail. Again, it has that one piece shell. This is a, the underside, the ventral side of a whelk. This is a, people often ask me what that white chain is. Um, it is laying a series of eggs. It's a really interesting looking organism. Here we have a marine slug. I think people don't appreciate how cool and pretty slugs can be. Um, this is a really interesting type of marine slug. Um, here is a white marine slug, again, just showing you a ton of variety in how these slugs can look. This <coughs> is it extending its mantle out a little bit. Um, this is another marine slug. Again, huge variety in just slugs. They're really interesting organisms. Here are limpets, which are another type of gastropod. Has anyone seen or heard of a limpet before? So what's special about limpets? They have some special abilities. Yeah, Paige? Yeah, so they're going to be able to grasp on to a surface really well. It takes, what is it, 70 pounds of pull per square inch to remove a limpet. So they're capable of locking on, again, using that non Newtonian fluid I mentioned. Here's the underside of a limpet. It's able to grasp onto things with that surface. All right, here we have a razor clam. What do we think this is coming out? The foot. Awesome. Has anyone eaten a razor clam before? Pretty delicious and also enormous to so get some heads shaking. Um, all over the What was that? All over the Yes, these are huge, cool, common organisms if you're in the right places. Um, here we have a giant clam. Um, it's opening up. These are the gills inside. Here are some examples of scallops, which again, I think most people just picture the scallop that you get in the grocery store, just the meat, but they have really interesting, cool shells. These are some nice variety of our scallops. All right, so we have a nice clam diagram. In addition to that, we have in the back a clam model. Again, with both these models, the highlighted structures on the key are the only ones I care you know about. When you start trying to dissect the clam, um, you're going to be looking for a lot of different structures that probably won't end up being as neat as this, if I had to wager a guess. Um, but it's important that we be able to figure out the bilateral symmetry of this organism. I said there's a front and a left, or excuse me, a front and a back, a left and a right, um, which is new. The key for figuring this out, the structure you're going to clue in on when you're trying to start dissection is called the umbo. It is this bump here. <clears throat> the umbo is going to be closer to our anterior end. So we have our anterior and our posterior. So when you start navigating this organism, start by finding the umbo, which will be really obvious, and then you'll be able to determine how everything is laid out. Yeah, it's on both sides of the hinge, if you want to call that. Yeah. Um, again, you're going to be, before you open it up, you're going to be really easy to see. All right, so now we get into our cephalopods. We have our squid and our octopus. Um, here's another example of squid. You'll be, as I said a couple times, you'll be dissecting a squid today, which is often one of the cooler dissections. 
Um, here's a tiny octopus. It's again fade out. That is a penny <coughs> right there. So you have an idea of the scale of how tiny that organism is. This is a blue ringed octopus. This organism is about the size of a golf ball, um, but it is one of the most toxic organisms in the world. It can kill an adult human despite being that tiny. I do not recommend you hold a blue ringed octopus like this, even if you're wearing a glove, and don't let your child put their face that close to it as a general rule. Um, but you can see it's a really interesting organism. Here we have that nautilus um, with a nice cross section so you can actually see how it exists in its shell. Um, and again, you'll be able to look at a shell over there. Um, this sounds really bad, but do those exist right now? Yes. Yes, it's not a, it sort of looks like a prehistoric animal, but these are around. They're not as common by any means. Um, but yeah, this is a real, real life example. Um, here's a Nautilus, again, in real life. All right, questions? Do you want to fill that up for you? Yeah, Jasmine. What do you call the 